Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 9 Run Kit and Trevor, now on the coast of Japan, found themselves detained by Paco, Thomas's point man, and the brothers of the Sinaloa. Having been directed to a port harboring a readied vessel, it became clear to the two they had been beaten to the punch. It was a decent sized vessel somewhat small inside. A seating area for perhaps a dozen, it maintained a light and elegant decor, obviously well maintained by the Inagawa Kai. Paco, clearly having already gained access to the vehicle, as the lights inside were now on, continued leading a conversation the three had been engaged in for the last few moments. And while Kit and Trevor sat on a bench lined with soft white cushions, the brothers sat across from them on an identical bench, waiting patiently as he spoke. Paco, in his rather typical demeanor, stood in a kitchenette, a small bar separating himself from the four others. Kit, you have been a busy girl, no? He questioned as he began to list the enemies she had made over the recent short span of time. Agent Shields is not happy with you, my friend. And now? You sit here before me, with Signor Meeks at your side. What importance is he to you, I wonder? Paco leaned forward and casually lit a cigarette as he continued to speak to his hostages. Trevor, sitting next to a seemingly indifferent kit, looked at Paco with boredom. This gangster loved giving his little speeches, he thought to himself. It was these exact monologues, Trevor felt that Paco enjoyed most. After taking a puff, Paco then looked at Kit and not receiving a reply of what she was doing with Trevor, he continued speaking. That is okay, Miss Kit. I find out soon, eh? For now, perhaps you tell me how to use these, yes. He said this while pulling out the two green cubes Kit had brought with her, as she then began to look at him with anger in her eyes. Seeing himself gain this reaction from his female hostage, Paco slowly smiled and continued once more. Ah, I see. This is what I think it is, eh? This magic DX4 I have heard so much of, he said. And then, turning to look out in the dark sky, framed within a window behind him, he began speaking, as if thinking to himself. Agent Shields, once you brought to him alive. You are very important to him and his bosses. And then you have these cubes. Something of a modern legend amongst the ones still stuck on this planet. On top of all of this, you show up with Trevor at your side. A man who I am told is dead. 
I am beginning to think you are of much more value than I have been led to believe. I am starting to believe you may be of more value to me than all the supplies I get from bringing you both in, eh? And that was when he turned back to them, pocketing the cubes as he proceeded with sharing his thoughts. You see, there are, how you say, pros and cons to being a private contractor with the Russians. Of course, putting aside the massive risk of working within such conflicting interest, such as these rivaling cartels, there are good things too. Good things you would not think to consider. For instance, being the cartel member. Very rewarding. Especially these days, yes. Well fed and well supplied. But a private contractor, such as myself, one can make last-minute executive decisions whenever they wish to. Trevor began to wonder what this man was possibly building up to as he began to furrow his brow. Pauko continued to speak, maintaining his charismatic ways while doing so. Take you two, for example. You are wanted by many men. Men that I work for. He lowered his voice and gestured to the gangsters sitting across from the two not seeming to take much interest in Paco's soliloquies. Your typical soldier, or even a general, will always follow through with his orders. A private contractor, on the other hand, can see the pair in front of them as a windfall of its very own. The two brothers slowly looked at each other while remaining in their seats and turned their heads to look at Kit and Trevor. Perhaps you possess knowledge of something of importance, yes? Or maybe you know a way off this fucking planet. This twisted, diabolical web of fucked up shit. Whatever it is, do not worry. I will find out. Whatever it is, or wherever it is, I will have what you are both hiding. Even if I have to cut it out of each of you. He then looked at them with an exhausted scowl. So, tell me, Trevor. What is it? What makes Senor Meeks a special man? Why are you important to Miss Kit? Now, Paco, having finished, watched Trevor do his best to give him the middle finger. Trevor could hear Lucas's voice in his head. If they know what you are, the enemy will eliminate you immediately. Paco smiled larger, baring his teeth, and then looked at the brothers and nodded. Show Trevor what his companion's brains look like. Trevor now found himself in a rather perplexing situation, not wanting to expose their position to their captor, at risk of what Pauko may do with such knowledge. On the other hand, after seeing the ruthless ways of the criminal contractor, he felt that Pauko was not bluffing and quickly objected. Okay, fuck. All right, I don't know why I'm important. We just know that we need to get to the Philippines. We don't even know where in the Philippines. We were going to find out more when we get there. It was at that moment, Pauko looked at Trevor and spoke with a smile. Then let's go to the Philippines. We have a plane down at the airstrip. Pauko's eyes lit up while Trevor's rolled in frustration. Kit seemed carefree of the whole matter. Meanwhile, in South America, as darkness filled the skies, it held with it a promise of tranquility, only grifting its prey below as it moved forth its diabolical schemes of human trafficking. As far as the eye could see, vegetation was rampant as shades of brown and green seemed to be the common theme. While the moonlight lit what little it could, it held within it a community some may find familiar as they look upon the town of Tunja, Colombia. Once a quiet town, it basked in the far reaches of the municipalities of an ancient symbol of ultimate corruption and greed, while seeming to boast of the remaining occupants scrambling for food and water, having been isolated from all hope, it now became overrun by the Sinaloa. Here we find military vehicles everywhere, 
one being the truck that had recently been occupied by Thomas Shields and Chavez Cruz. It sat in front of a small house, with men outside guarding an open door within the grass. Aside from that, one would find it lacking any tragic scenario, resembling a deceptive description of the distasteful events unfolding inside. The interior of the home was dark, and being also dark outside, this made the task harder for the multitudes of candles attempting to light the interior. Now, however, they were being assisted by flashlights darting around the room, attached to rifles. These rifles were held by members of the Sinaloa as Chavez continued to speak, standing next to his client, Thomas Shields. As he addressed the entire room of eight hostages, he sounded as though he were becoming frustrated. He interrogated his victims with a threatening tone while speaking Spanish, all eight kneeling in a line before him, some crying. As flashlights darted across their faces, seven adults and a small child no older than seven trembled in fear. They knelt in front of their captor as armed men aimed guns at them. Chavez walked up to one of the men and placed the tip of his gun under his chin. I know this military was here. Tell me which way they went. While staring at the man, he listened for a response. After a moment with no answer, he pulled his trigger as the man was thrust back to the floor behind him. The others screamed. He came up to the next person, a woman, and again placed his gun's tip, this time on the woman's forehead. I will leave you with food and supplies. Just tell me which way they have gone. He waited again, somewhat surprised by their resistance. So again, he pulled the trigger as hostage number two fell to the floor. As he walked up to the next victim, he noticed it was a small boy, maybe six or seven. He smiled at the terrified boy and kneeled at his side. Hey, cheer up friend, everything is okay. I tell you what, I bet you, if you ask your mommy really nicely, she might let you live. Would you like that? The little boy didn't understand, but nodded his head at the sound of the positive twist. Okay then, just ask your mommy which way they went. Just then he was interrupted by someone who came into the room from outside. Senor Chavez, the south end is clear. Not many people. They found a woman though. She's detained down the street. I couldn't get her to say much, but after some encouragement, she spoke a little. The Chancellor has done well at silencing them. Chavez looked up at him. And what did she say? The soldier's face contorted as he thought for a second, making sure to recollect the words properly. She said they made a deal not to speak. She said the Chancellor promised to end all their suffering. Chavez then looked at the man standing behind the little boy, appearing to look like his father. He stared into his eyes as he remained kneeling in front of the small boy. He slowly aimed his gun at the child, and while holding his father's gaze, he spoke to him. Which way did they go, senor? The man bowed his head with silence, signaling his refusal to answer. Chavez grew a look of anger and pulled the trigger as hostage three now joined the others. He then stood up and handed his pistol to a soldier standing near him. He spoke as Thomas and him began to leave the room. Kill them all. As five more gunshots, one quickly after the other sounded off, Thomas and Chavez made their way across the small dark room leading to the front door. Moments later, after making their exits, Thomas and Chavez stood outside not seeming to be upset as they remained focused, calculating their next move. With their entire army surrounding them, they processed the situation as they attempted to form a strategy. They were smoking cigarettes and deciding steps to take next when they were suddenly interrupted by another soldier. He had a local with him and was pushing him roughly up to his boss by periodically pushing the tip of his rifle into the man's back. He spoke to his commanding officer as he approached with his hostage. North side is nearly vacant, sir. It seems it's been evacuated. There are a few homes with occupants, though. 
This man is one of them, and he has something for you. The man was reluctantly walking toward Chavez, encouraged by his aggressor as the cartel leader addressed him. He was an elderly man dressed in tattered clothing and had a long beard. Quickly, old man, what is it? Chavez barked. The man reached into his pocket and pulled out a folded piece of paper. He then nervously handed it over to the shouting gangster in front of him. Chavez swiped it out of his hand, and while throwing him a stern look, he unfolded it to view its contents. As he peered down, he saw a letter addressed to him personally. And that letter read, Senor Cruz, my friend, it has been too long. I understand you are looking for me. Perhaps with Senior Shields? My men tell me you are moving with vigor. This leads me to believe you are unaware. I possess a back channel within the last state. An anonymous line of communication, you might say. You wouldn't believe the timeliness of that same military's air force in initiating an airstrike on a suggested high-risk target. As I am sure you are now hastily calculating your escape, I leave you with this, Mr. Cruz. Consider it a distant word of advice from an old friend. If you find yourself only holding a knife, avoid the lethally armed man standing next to you. Yours sincerely, the Chancellor. Immediately, Chavez passed the paper to Thomas and looked at the sad old man standing before him with growing anger in his face. While Agent Shields read the letter, Chavez addressed the man in his language. Where did this person head? Where did the Chancellor go? The man looking down said nothing. Instead, he just slightly shivered as a cool breeze overtook his body. That's when the soldier who had discovered him spoke up, while Thomas, now having read the letter, watched the stark scene before him quickly unfold. Sir, he has one more thing to show you. As he said this, he looked at the man and barked an order while giving him a shove. Camisa. Ahora. At that point, the man turned around and slowly lifted his shirt, revealing freshly cut lacerations. When his shirt was finally lifted completely, Chavez and Shields pointed their flashlights at the man's back. And there, etched into his skin, a word came into focus. Run. That's when they could hear it. The sounds of a fleet of military jets from within the distance. Thomas slammed the Chancellor's letter against Chavez's chest and spoke seriously. Evacuate. At that point, the town became extremely active as the Sinaloa began to scramble in an attempt to mobilize and successfully evacuate before the sounds in the distance soon spelled their fate. As the lead vehicle, Thomas and Chavez's truck, hastily made its way through the meandering streets of Tunja as the sounds of the airstrike neared. They were holding on as their driver made no effort to take the corners with any sense of ease. As their army followed closely behind, nearly 30 militarized vehicles sped through the empty town, closing in on its furthest borders. As Thomas looked in the mirror while they were clearing the city limits, he watched as a flash of light lit up the skies, the city behind him lying in the path of hell on earth. A bird's eye view would depict a city engulfed in flames and a convoy of 14 vehicles making their way from the bright yet darkened Colombian community. This while leaving more than half their fleet behind having succumbed to the heavy fire that rained down upon them. As Thomas began to grasp the irony of being targeted by his former nation's military, at the behest of a cartel leader he had once locked up for that same nation, he and Chavez now looked for cover in order to refortify. Several hours later, and atop a hill as the morning sky rose over the Colombian jungles, several men stood by outside their vehicles. Thomas and Chavez stared quietly, viewing the devastation below them. They knew what was on everyone's mind. The Sinaloa quickly began to realize that they were now a lesser size of the faction they sought to rein in. The worst part was, 
they were thousands of miles away from any possible sanctuary or reinforcements. Not only that, they were also in the middle of nowhere, likely within the Beltran Leva spy network. They both knew the Chancellor would soon learn of the small remainder left, representing the advance on his faction. It chilled them upon the next sobering thought. With far less supplies and a deficit of manpower, they had no clue as to what dark jungle corners the Chancellor's men may now be lurking within. The afternoon brought with it a subtle amount of humidity as it came into its prime. It held within its skies a blurry white sun as a thin layer of clouds blocked out any of the light it pursued to cast on the floors below. A landing strip lay quietly among the dense tall grass to all sides. A wide view of the Lingayen Gulf, dwarfing the landing strip, announces its allegiance with the surrounding West Philippine seas. Off in the distance, a small white plane makes its final approach, as Kit and Trevor were about to touch ground in the Philippines, their captors in tow. Aboard the plane sat in separate seats, now bound at the wrists and hands. They remained silent. Paco had been sleeping a few seats in front of them, while directly across the aisle sat the brothers, dutifully watching the pair of hostages. Two men Paco had stationed at the plane back in Japan when they had boarded, piloted the aircraft, bringing it down for a soft landing. And as they touched down, the two brothers slowly looked at each other and then back at Kit and Trevor and gave them two fleeting smiles. Eventually, the plane exhausted most of the runway as it came to a slow rolling stop. Not long after that, Paco stood up, now awake, and spoke to the pair with excitement. In this area of the Philippines, you recommended is where I'll also call home when I am here. Places I am familiar with. I'm glad your search can start here, eh? And I tell you what, if you are worth what I think you are worth, I will kill you quickly. In that case, you should be thankful. Because if I find you are worthless to me, my mind can go to very dark places. Paco smiled and patted Trevor on the forehead. Don't be so serious, Mr. Meeks. Have some fun. Like you Americans say, life is short, eh? Trevor ignored Pauko as he held back his annoyance with him. As him and Kit were brought to their feet, they were quickly ushered outside. There, they were met with an empty landing strip. A small distance away sat a vehicle, fueled with a key under the windshield wiper. These items came complements of Pauko's contacts in the area, as he alerted them of his needs by radio, hours ago. As they walked to the car, now unbound, Kit and Trevor found themselves being shoved by the two cartel generals that now seemed to serve at Paco's pleasure. With Paco picking up the rear and the two pilots carrying the luggage beside him, the group made their way down the tarmac towards the prepared vehicle, the hostages leading the way. Kit, knowing that now, while still unbound, if she wanted to get out of this, she had to make her move. And as if being pinned into a tight and fatal corner, had somehow released something inside of her. She turned and faced her captors, catching Trevor by surprise. As she looked at the three gangsters, her eyes somewhat darkened as she began to lower her head. Suddenly, the three dropped their guns and fell to their knees as they reached for their throats, seeming to be strangled by some invisible force. Just then, the two men piloting the plane left the luggage and began to run back for cover, but were only met with the same fate Paco and the brothers now found themselves in, each falling to their hands and knees, gasping for a next possible breath. Trevor appeared to be beside himself, as Kit kept her darkened gaze upon their suffocating enemies. Eventually, as their five adversaries were each robbed of their last breath, Kit relented as her eyes began to clear. She stood for a moment in silence as she gained her composure before turning to Trevor and flashing a kit-like smile. With that, she headed back to the luggage to get their things that had been taken from them so they could make their getaway with the conveniently placed vehicle, 
compliments of Paco. But before she could get too far, Trevor interjected with a few things now on his racing mind. Hold up. What in the actual fuck was that? Having put all his thoughts into the best sentence he could articulate, after witnessing what had just happened, Kit turned around, put a hand on one hip, and stood with an impatient attitude. She rolled her eyes as she looked at Trevor before she replied to him. Can we kindly do questions later, when we're not sitting on a fucking tarmac like sitting ducks? Trevor looked down at the five dead bodies and then back up to Kit, her hair lightly blowing in the breeze as she squinted her eyes, waiting for Trevor to allow them to move on with their day. He then tried pressing the matter one more time. Fine then, just tell me one thing. If you could do that all along, why didn't you just do it to begin with? Kit rolled her eyes and looked at him with confusion and shrugged her shoulders as if the answer were obvious. She looked back at the plane and then back to Trevor, then back to the plane again and almost comically one last time back to Trevor and finally spoke. Trevor, I couldn't fly the fucking plane, could you? With that, she turned and walked back to the luggage to gather their much-needed supplies. Trevor looked down to the bodies and displayed a face that kind of agreed with his female companion's logic. Then, attempting to set his shock aside, he shook it off and followed Kit to the luggage to assist her. Leaving Paco and the Sinaloa brothers to lay on the cracked tarmac under the dimly lit skies. Oh.